is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering One Piece, episodes 504 and 505, to live up to the promise, departures of their own, and I want to see them, Luffy's mournful cry. In these chapters, we are still getting a little bit of flashback, but for the most part, it seems like we're moving back into the present, and it's a lot more agonizing after the flashbacks, to be honest. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Florian for commissioning this episode. This time it really is Florian, not Michael. So thank you, Florian. Yeah, I I think that I was a little taken aback, actually, after there being so much in the flashbacks. And I think just last episode I was saying, like, that... I had expected the flashbacks to be shorter for that to take up less time and that there had been way more of a story there than I had been expecting in a similar vein. Once we had like really gotten into it, I thought that would continue and was not ready for us to jump back into the present at this point. So it's kind of funny. I feel like I keep getting sort of, Blindsided is too strong a word, but I just keep getting uh, like a little unexpected surprise. Um, so yeah, let's let's start with five hundred four to live up to the promise because it is it, this one is a really surprisingly like moving one. Um, we start off with Ace as usual, just with his fucking. <sighs> you guys he is so angry all the time i don't know why he has to have this attitude but lord almighty he really does um and oh my god you guys i'm so sorry okay full disclosure y'all i you know how i put the episode on in the background so that i can refer to it when i'm recording i don't know how i miss this because like I didn't take my phone out while I was recording or while I was watching this episode. The only thing that I was doing was like petting Pippin who was sitting with me. And I don't know how I missed the fact that there's like a tiny Zorro here doing weightlifting. And I had a moment while I was recording just now where I saw this and I thought I had started the wrong episode. Because I completely missed it. And the boys who are talking about, I bet he needs that biggest ship to hold his giant head. They're talking about Eva, you know, out on the ship with Dragon. I don't know how the fuck I missed that Zoro was here as a little kid. Is Zoro going to turn out to actually be like related to Luffy? Like what is going on with Dragon being here? where Zoro is. Uh, he said the, there's like this moment where on the ship, Zoro or not Zoro, sorry, dragon is talking to Eva and just says, sorry. And Eva says, goodness, is that someone get help? This doesn't look good. Let's prepare treatment, Roger. And I don't know what they're referring to because Dragon doesn't look injured to me. And I don't know. The the fact that they're saying treatment makes me think like he contracted some sort of disease. I don't know. But whatever it was that he was doing, he went without Eva, who is resentful. And I love the fact that when Eva says, why didn't you take me? And Dragon replies, because you would attract too much attention. Obviously. Eva's internal dialogue is, could it be that I'm too fabulous? Which is honestly what I need to tell myself every time, like, 
I am just too much for something. It's just, I'm simply too fabulous. I'm so sorry. Um, so yeah, this, uh, moment with Zoro, why is dragon here? And was Zoro on the same Island? They like, they've left where Ace and Luffy were already, right? This isn't the same place. I don't even know what to think here. How did I miss that, you guys? I'm so sorry if you're listening. Like, Jesus Christ, Natasha. Apologies. I really was paying attention, I swear. I don't know how I missed it. I must have just been too enraptured in Pippin's adorable face, and I won't apologize for that. So we go from that little interlude back to uh, Great Terminal, and it's really funny, honestly, to me, you guys. I couldn't help but laugh at this, because... Despite the burning of Grey Terminal being truly awful, I'm not trying to dismiss that at all. It was unconscionable. Everybody is right to be outraged. However, despite that, they very quickly have just a new influx of trash and a new influx of scavengers. So really, their whole goal here of getting rid of all of them just goes to shit like right away. And I just think that's very, very funny. I mean, I'm sorry, that is like, it. What all of that, and all of the ill will that you brought upon yourselves. And for what reason? What did you actually accomplish? Oh, there is something so embarrassing about that. So yeah, things are kind of back to normal. And we also see Luffy and Ace fighting. And there is this moment here. You guys, I had been... And I'm I'm kind of loath to take this back. But the scene is about Luffy and Ace coping with the fact that Sabo is gone. And the two of them, like, Ace is just straight talking about talking as if Sabo is standing right there. And when he does, Luffy sort of picks up and does the same thing. And it's like, yeah, tell him. And then they both realize that what they're talking to is just like a lump of stone that happens to be around the right height. And that they're so used to Sabo being there out of the corner of their eye that they took it for granted. It was him and talked to it. And they're brought up short, realizing, you know, of course, that that is not a person. And I was so, how to say this? I can't help but wonder how real this is. Like, how much, how, is it true that Sabo is really dead? Because The more I think about it, he was so close to shore that if he had died or if he had if he hadn't died and were floating in the water, he would be able to swim to shore. And he the place he would naturally swim would be the island. They're right there. The only alternative that I could see is that he somehow got scooped up by the Marines from the like wreckage of his ship. And I don't, I don't think if he were like a, if he were actually a pirate, if they saw him that way, which they had to have done to fire on him the way that they did. I don't know that they would keep him prisoner or not. You know what I'm saying? And So now I'm starting to wonder if it really is that Sabo is dead. I just took it for granted. I'll be totally honest with you guys that he was going to turn up eventually and be fine and that it would be a very unexpected thing, but that he had managed to make his way in the world by himself. And I just, the more that this sort of goes on the way that it does, the less certain I become that that's how it's going to go. I don't know. I don't know whether I want for him to, for that death to have been real or not, because you guys know that like, I appreciate there being genuine stakes. I think that 
I like Sabo enough that I would really prefer he weren't dead. So mm, I'm really torn on this one, y'all. But I'm curious if anybody else out there, when listening, had the same like reaction that I did, where you just assumed, of course, he's still alive and he's still out there. Because I just feel like, be- due to the, the track record of this show really not killing people off, usually, if there's no body, there's no death... I, I absolutely took it for granted that he was still alive, but one of the when I say that like people don't die in this show for the most part, the only exceptions to that have been in flashbacks, and this has been a flashback, so maybe he is gone, which makes the whole thing like much sadder. So anyway, the two of them sort of get into an argument, Luffy and Ace. Um, because they are just butting heads without the sort of middling influence of Sabo, who managed to be the peacekeeper a lot of the time. Luffy says something about how Sabo was way nicer than you, which Ace takes as, are you saying I should have been the one who died? Which, like, granted, is not what Luffy said, but I can understand how he takes it to that place right away. And Luffy is like, well, I didn't say anything like that. I'm just saying that you can just like not be as mean to me. And Ace is just like, yeah, whatever. And the next scene is the two of them declaring separate kingdoms to Dadan with their little like, it's um, they, they've got these stalls built in the yard with signs that look almost like a weird lemonade stand kind of vibe. And uh, they are ignoring one another very studiously to the point that in the next scene when Luffy is about to fight a bear and he asks for Ace's help Ace just straight up says what? The mighty king Luffy needs help? And doesn't lift a finger. And then when Luffy attempts to fight this bear and gets walloped with those claws Ace is fucking surprised. I get it. He's a child. But the fact that he's like, oh my God, he told you that bear was like 25 times his size. Sir, what what is the matter with you? You have got to get over this anger. You've got to set it aside. And eventually he clearly does, but it's just like really difficult to watch in the, in the moment. Um, so yeah, he brings Luffy back to the cabin to Magra is the name of the guy with the uh, mohawk. I will never remember his name. But he takes care of Luffy and says something like, um, if that cut had been any deeper, he would probably have died on the spot. And Ace is flipping out. You know, he's cr- sobbing, crying. And he says, it's all my fault. I knew better. Even if you're a captain, fighting alone doesn't make you any stronger. I'm still no good. I'm still not good enough. I'm so weak. And this is what Luffy is saying like later in the present when we return to him. He is just like, I, I just, I'm still so weak. So I think this moment is sort of the unifying moment for the two of them. The fact that they managed to get through this together, that Ace left him by himself, fucked up, acknowledges that he fucked up, and is prepared to try and work with Luffy. And I wish... I think this is the the, the issue for me when I say that, like, we come back to the present a little sooner than I had anticipated. I think I was hoping to get a little bit more time with the boys watching them actually working together because we mostly get to see them like at odds, butting heads all the time. And then Ace has this kind of revelation and then we jump ahead like five years And he is 17 years old and Luffy is, what is he at that point? 14, I think. And 
they are like best pals at that point. And I just would have liked a like montage or something of Ace actually figuring out how to encourage Luffy, how to work with him and develop the rubber abilities and, and make them work for him rather than uh, jumping immediately from him having a sort of breakdown to the two of them getting along amazingly and not having seen anything in between. I just, I, I think that I was so taken aback at how angry Ace was throughout all of these flashbacks that I didn't expect we would spend so little time with Ace when he had begun to come to terms with his anger and direct it in a more, oh, what's the word? A productive place, I guess. Like, I thought that I would get the reward of seeing the two of them working well together because I had suffered through Ace's bouts of anger and taking it out on Luffy. And I just feel like I didn't get the reward I wanted. I wanted to see the way that they eventually bonded and worked together over this. I don't know. Um, and it's the, the way that this eventually goes. So like I'm, I'm jumping back into the flashback. Um, Makino has come to visit Ace and she says, you want to know how to properly say thank you. And what's this about paying respects? And he says, as a pirate and as Luffy's big brother, I need to pay my respects to this Shanks guy. Luffy says he owes the man his life, so it's the least I can do. This is like the closest that we get to the two of them working together amiably is this weird, like, learning to respect elders and and be polite thing. And it's just such a departure from what their priorities had been that I feel like that's why it felt unsatisfying to me. But um, I suppose you could count this as them showing the two of them working together. I don't know. But um, Makino is looking at Ace and when she like, when he says that he wants to pay Shanks back, she gets a sort of expression and looks at him and then tilts her head and puts it on her hand. And I couldn't tell what I was supposed to read from that motion. I feel like it looks almost as like if he weren't a literal child, I think I would have taken this as her being like, Oh, you're so dreamy, a sort of flirty kind of vibe. But I don't think that's it. So the way I'm taking it instead is sort of, Oh my God, you're growing up. You're interested in like showing gratitude and what progress for you. You know what I'm saying? I don't know that that's what is supposed to be the the uh, takeaway here. So I'm really curious. Anybody listening, if you uh, feel like chiming in on the Discord, just it's it's a small moment, but I just was sort of curious if there was something that I was missing or is it the fact that he says that he's going to thank Shanks and is she sort of like hot for Shanks and the mention of him kind of makes her go, huh, you know, like I really wasn't sure um, the the interpretation of that little moment and it's not important. It's just my curiosity. So anyway, uh, Makino winds up being the one that sort of instructing them on how to do this for starters after a meal and we get to see the two of them dine and dash again in like upper the uptown and then as they're dining and dashing luffy and ace say oh god hold on we got to pay our respects they stop running from the chef and just bow and say thank you for the meal sir keep your thanks. Are you brats going to pay me or what? And that is when it like cuts. It just immediately cuts from there. That shit killed me. You guys, the fact that they thanked this guy, I kind of wanted him to be like, Oh, that's kind of adorable, but I don't blame him as a business person. Like, um, so 
okay, you know what, guys? I forgot about the part where they fight the bear together. I'm seeing that now. So I've got to give credit for this because I was feeling like, come on, I want I want more of this. But I'm lying. We get them fighting some things and it's not exactly <sighs> what I was imagining was less them just fighting side by side and more Ace gassing Luffy up and learning how to encourage him in a more like guidance older brothery type of way. But I get what this is that this is supposed to sort of be that for the two of them. So I still maintain that I would have liked to see that simply because so little positive reinforcement has come off of Ace toward Luffy. But uh, I feel like there was an effort made at least. This like scene, you guys, when fucking Garp shows up and just like beats the shit out of them, apparently. I know that this is part of the way media worked with like in the in the 90s early 2000s especially with cartoons and probably it's also like a cultural thing as well but i have got to say out loud how troubling it is for me that all of the adults that care about kids in this series like the men at least tend to beat the shit out of those kids. Like, I just feel like I, I understand that it's meant to be a, a, their tough love and getting them ready for the real But it's just, it's so fucked up. And the fact that it's just been taken for granted, like, I can't help but see as just really disturbing, you know? And this scene where he just shows up and like punches the hell out of them in the context of knowing what happens later with Ace and the fact that like Garp doesn't do everything he could to save Ace. I can't help but feel a bit of a way about it, you know? So anyway, this is when we jump forward to uh, in time and we have Ace getting into his little like skiff and saying goodbye to everybody and i noted the fact that like standing on the land we don't see dadan and i was sort of like where is she why didn't she come and it turns out that she like stayed at the house and didn't want to go because i guess she was feeling like too intensely and didn't want to face it and we have her smoking and just thinking back to when she was brought the baby ace the baby and uh her men come in and are like believe it or not he's gone and she says well that's one less brat to worry about though i'm sure garp will give me hell for it and one of them says i've got a message for you from him and she says why should i care he probably just wants to tell me my feet smell or something he said thank you for taking care of me and she just starts sobbing crying I just, I really liked this. Dadan is a really, really fun character. Like, she's not a good caretaker. I would not say that. But I enjoy that she does her best. I really feel like she does her best, you know? So, this is when we go to Luffy, who is uh, practicing by himself at this point with the gum gum pistol and it's really fun to watch him like finally beginning to get this down i really wasn't ready for how satisfying it was going to feel to see him manage to finally nail this and sabo is standing there like smiling at him and i think the fact that sabo keeps turning up as a sort of force ghost as if in luffy's mind is what's making me think Sabo's genuinely dead. Like, if he weren't gone, the two of them would be like, imagine, like, I feel like they'd be like, what would Sabo say? But the show wouldn't depict him visually as a ghost the way that they are. And 
it just really bums me out. I think he really is gone, and I just wanted him to be around still. This sucks. Um, so then we have Luffy getting the newspaper where Ace is mentioned, and he's got a ship and crew and everything, and he says, oh, I'm so jealous, but he starts laughing and says, I'm going to do even better. And I just love seeing Luffy being happy for him. So then it says three years later, Luffy, 17 years old, and he goes up to the house and says, I'm leaving. You're not going to see me off. And Dadan says, use your head. The mayor and Makino wouldn't mind us stopping by. But as for everyone else in Windmill Village, we'll probably scare the pants right off them. Don't make it awkward. Just go already. And Luffy just, for a minute, he looks sad. And then he's just like, all right, well, bye, you guys. Thanks for everything. I'm sure going to miss you. And they all start crying as well, blushing, whatnot. Um, and one last thing. Dadan, I still think mountain bandits are super lame. <laughs> but you guys, you're great. And once again, she begins sobbing, crying. It's not enough to ruin my life. Now you got to break my heart, too. You're awful, I tell you. All of you are good for nothing. Ah, oh, you guys, it's so good. I love her. She's such a goon. Um, so then we get from the narration, the edge of the Goa kingdom. Uh, why don't you take my old fishing boat instead, Luffy? This thing is going to sink as soon as you get out to sea. It's too small even for you. And he says, I want to start small, but I'll get a real big one soon. Don't worry. And there's a lot of people out here cheering him on. A lot of people who are just like, rooting for him, which I really, really liked. Like, I didn't expect all of these sort of random townsfolk around here, you know? And he yells about how Sabo is, like, sort of looking down on him. Like, that's the way he's uh, he's just like, I'm. look at me, Sabo, you know? And it was a really moving moment, unexpectedly. Um, so he goes out and he immediately comes face to face with the fucking uh, sea king that had threatened him all those years ago when he was with Shanks. And he uses his gum gum pistol in sincerity for the first time and knocks the sea king out in a single punch. And everybody on the shore is just like, holy shit and Dadan gets all teary eyed and is just like I'm so proud of him and uh, Luffy is talking to himself about how many people he wants for his crew and is thinking about 10 and it's just like alright let's get going and that's the end of the episode you guys except for a brief brief moment where we go back to the present. Luffy's optimism from that day is nowhere in sight. And we see him again, sobbing, covered in bandages in the midst of this like clearing of trees that he's like uprooted and broken. And this is a real, this one's like fucked up for me. He's sitting in front of, uh, oh my God. I can't remember his name with the fish man. Oh my God. Jinbei. Jinbei. And he says, me, king of the pirates, what a joke. I cannot tell you guys how shook I was hearing him say that. This entire se 500 episodes. Granted, I haven't watched every single one, but I've watched at least like 475 this kid has been relentless and believing in himself. And then all of a sudden he's calling his dream a joke. I mean, shit is bad, real bad. Oh, this got me right in the heart. Y'all it really did. He says, look at me. I'm useless. And as he's saying this, there's like, 
superimposed over his face the footage of Ace falling to the ground with a giant hole in his chest. Oh my God. It really got to me. I was not prepared y'all for him to like just completely fall apart and to, to show such a lack of faith in himself after all this time and everything that he has been through. I'm, and he's just yelling about how weak he is. Um, so I just, you know, guys, this it's earned. I'll say that like him having this sort of crisis of faith after every, like all after the events of these last few episodes, in my opinion, it's exactly the right time for him to be feeling this way. I really think that this event was traumatic enough and a big enough deal both to him and to the audience that this is when you want to have this sort of like what's it all for kind of moment from a character like him who has been so single-minded and assured this whole time. But I just wasn't prepared for how upsetting it was going to be to hear those words come out of his mouth. It just sounds wrong. You know, he's just been the guy this entire time who has believed. And so for him to be not just like having a lack of faith, but to be like laughing at himself, like, and not, not in a good way, mocking himself. It just is unfair. And it, we, I think we've all been here, you know, had moments like this where we've stepped back and sort of looked at the the place we are in comparison to where we had thought we would be and just have a moment of like, I cannot believe I ever thought it was going to be any different than it is right now. In our darkest moments when we're just like, see, I said everything was going to fall apart and I was fucking right, you know, but God. I just really hate this for him because he earned so much more than this from himself. And I wish he was giving himself the credit he had built up. Anyway, all right. So uh, we go to Garp here and he's fucking blowing up a bunch of pirate ships that are off the coast of this island and evidently just go the 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 whole energy with garp and the way that he is coming at them as much as i understand that these are bad pirates there's also a big part of me that kind of felt like i after everything i don't want to see him blowing up pirates because i have feelings about him at this point and i am pissed so we come into the bar and uh, Dadon is downing like yet another beer and she is putting her glass down and asking for one, another one. And Mak Makino, is that her name? Is like, I think you've had enough. And Dadon says something like, so what? But then it's mentioned that Garp is here and she gets up and he comes into town Everybody is talking to him about how like things with the pirates have gotten really bad. And he explains that I took out the ones that were coming, heading this way, bunch of blowhards. And to top it off, in addition to taking them down, I'm also going to give you this because the Navy isn't going to say it out loud, but Whitebeard was really helping keep things like in check. And he points to this huge sign that says security by vice admiral garp and they're like all right yeah that'll keep scare them off for sure i hope that's true you know it seems like we're meant to believe that these signs do work for the most part i feel like that sort of thing probably doesn't but um and then this guy comes up to him and says, there's one more problem. A bunch of mountain bandits have come into the village and taken over Makino's bar and they refuse to leave. And this is when Makino backs out and Dadan comes out. And this for me was so satisfying. She says, how 
dare you show your face here after what you've done? And she bashes him in the head with her fucking mace. And Garp tells his men to back off because, of course, they start to step in to defend him. And he says she's a friend and she says the hell I am. You were right there on that battlefield with those poor boys and you didn't do a damn thing to help them. Why did you have me raise Ace? Why did you have me take care of them if this was going to be how it ended? And I got to tell you guys, I fucking loved this. What a real one. Asking the questions that need answers. I am just saying, this bitch is right. And I need her to say it. I was so glad that she just decided to fucking get in his face over this. Because I I can't let go of the fact... She even says a little bit later, you stood there... And watched him die. You care more about your damn job than your family. And then she just starts punching him repeatedly in the face. Calling him a heartless piece of crap. And that's honestly like the main takeaway that I also had from that. Was that he was more worried about losing his position with the Marines than he was about the life of Ace. And I mean, I can't respect that. I absolutely cannot. I don't know. I don't know if there's anything that can retroactively be told to me that would change the way I feel about this situation. You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel that the point I am currently at with the way I feel about Garp and how let down I am. I don't feel like there is going to be something that you can like retcon where I'm like, all right, well, I guess I understand then. And I may be wrong. Somebody, you know, may have come up with a thing. When I say somebody, obviously I'm talking about Oda, but it's just really hard for me to picture there being any sort of circumstance where I understand the fact that he like just stayed his hand there's so many things that i imagine that he could say like you know he was he was grown i wasn't meant to fight his battles anymore he wouldn't have wanted me to like there's all kinds of things that you could say but i just won't accept them i'll be perfectly honest i just don't think that i'm at a point where i would accept them so, you know, maybe uh, uh, I'm underestimating Oda's creative genius and he'll come up with something and I'll be like, God damn it. He figured one out. But from where I'm standing right now, I am just so irritated with him. And I'm so glad that Dadan just fucking calls him out because that was exactly how, what I was thinking. When I saw her face and the way she was crying, I my exact reaction was like, yeah, imagine that he like foisted these kids on you you didn't even really want to take them in or deal with them but you did it because you were being blackmailed basically and then he has the chance to like save one of their lives and he just doesn't do it i would be so pissed i just like i i and you've grown to like really love them oh my god i hated it and good for her Eventually, Makino comes and like stands between the two of them because Dadan is not letting up. And Makino says, how do you think he feels? He's their grandfather. He's suffering too. He was right there and he couldn't do a thing. And I was like, couldn't he though? You know, my immediate response is like, I don't think that's true. And again, Dadan just says, you're wrong. And I was like, thank you. Garp is suffering? No. The only one who's really suffering here is Luffy, damn it. I loved it on. 
I love her. I love her so much. Just like for the record, you know, I enjoyed her a lot to begin with, but these episodes just made me a fucking to Don Stan for life. Just absolutely the only person who has her head on straight about this whole thing, you know? And then we have Makino's eyes tearing up and her remembering this moment between her Ace and Luffy where <laughs> this is so funny, you guys. Uh, Ace is is supposed to be thanking her um, for these lessons. And what he says, because she says, let's learn some manners today. And he says, thank you for the lesson. And Luffy's like, hey, nice one. And Makino says, well, close. Since we haven't actually started, you should say thank you in advance. And Luffy says, really? That was wrong? It sounded polite to me. That may be true, but it's a special situation, so every detail has to be perfect. After all, Ace wants to pay respects to a very impressive captain, a friend of yours. So, Ace, this is so funny, you guys. I love this so much. Um, as a pirate and big brother, I've got to thank him for, for saving your life or we're both going to look bad. So she says, let's pretend Shanks is here with you right now. What do you say? Hi, I'm Ace. Who the hell are you? <laughs> I know you're pirates, but I don't think you'd be impressed. So then fancy meeting you here. She's boo. And then Luffy suggests trash talk. Hey, punk, what's your deal? Boo. Mister, what's your deal? Can he, because he didn't, and she says boo, and he, Luffy chimes in because he didn't say punk. Oh, my God. This was so much fun. I really, really enjoyed this. Um, so, eventually, eventually uh, Ace says, I'm going to learn some manners if it kills me. And Luffy over here is like totally distracted over the fact that he has found an anaconda nest and there are all these eggs that they could eat. And she is accusing Luffy of distracting Ace and Luffy's like, I'm not distracting him. I just can't get these eggs all by myself. Classic ADD Luffy. And when we come back to the present, Makino is like just crying outright. And Dadan says Luffy loved Ace more than anything in the world. And everyone around her is also crying, like the other bandits as well, watching this whole thing. Garp throughout, by the way, is just kneeling in front of her, bleeding. Uh, and the mayor comes and is just like, what happened to Luffy? They say he just like went missing after the war ended. And Garp says that's true. A submarine carried him away. The admirals attacked and tried to stop him from escaping. And afterwards, they held a search, but they couldn't find a single trace of him. There was no shipwreck, so he's probably alive. And the crowd is just like, oh, good. Somebody in the crowd, what's up with this bandit? Why did Garp let her punch him like that? And Dadan turns around and she she says, Luffy's been a little moron since the day I met him. But no matter what he does, I'm always on his side. As much as I'm hurting, I know he's got it worse and it breaks my heart. And I just, oh, you guys, this is just so good. She just stands there in the midst of everything and yells, Luffy, I know things are hard right now, but don't you dare give up. And it's so prescient because that's exactly what he's on the verge of doing. And I love the fact that she seems to have like, she understood that somehow. Um, so then we go to the new world. And we see this amazing memorial that has been built for both Ace and Whitebeard. And there is a massive group of people here paying their respects. 
lots of flower petals fluttering about. And I have to say that as much as I loved this, there was a big part of me that felt really bad that Luffy couldn't be here for this. I just, and, and this is often the way that the people who were closest to the person who died are are still like in such grief that they can't even attend the wake or funeral or memorial or whatever it is that you decide to do. So I understand. And Luffy is also a wanted man. I'm not sure how much he could be out here anyway, but like, I definitely felt like I wished he was here and it was such a peaceful and beautiful spot with so many people paying their respects that I feel like Luffy would have been really gratified to see how many friends Ace had made and the way that he was being remembered. Um, and there's a, a moment here where Shanks is talking about, uh, as for Whitebeard and Ace, um, I'm sure you won't object to their friends taking care of the burial. Uh, and we see Sengoku saying, let me take responsibility. This is like a little flashback. So that's why these things are so sort of over the top. These, these memorials, gravestones. Um, Shanks. And I really liked this. Shanks is thinking about Ace and is like, he died like a true man. And honestly, a part of me felt like that wasn't true. Ace died for pride. He didn't die for a good reason. He died because he was trying to make a point. And he could have walked away and this could have been over. But he didn't decide to handle it that way. And I personally feel like that actually makes him really immature still. I have a hard time with the ways in which this show tries to demonstrate masculinity because it can feel like we're all over the place a little bit. And that's sort of the way I felt in this scene because, you know, the ace, sorry, Shanks is talking about this as though he admires the way that Ace went out. But then he talks about how Ace was a lot like his father because his father also was the type that like refused to back down, refused to walk away from a fight and was like too bold to cry. And I wish that he had known that there's nothing wrong with walking away and there's nothing wrong with crying. And so it was sort of confusing for me because I think Shanks is right, but it also felt like he was sort of proud of Ace. And I was like, I don't know. Ace is, I, I understand that he died for something that he believed in, but ultimately it was just pride really. You know, it wasn't, I don't know. I don't know, you guys. What do you think? Um, but yeah, he says eventually, like, the, there's no shame in backing down. And there's no shame in tears. And uh, Shanks is probably the, w the most well-balanced out of all the pirate captains. You know, the fact when he says, like, as long as you can overcome it um, and remembering the way that he was when that pirate came into town and he didn't fight back the way that Luffy wanted him to. And he was just like, all he did was pour beer on me and it doesn't matter. Like, Shanks is truly elevated in a way that none of the other captains are. And it's a good thing that Luffy had him as a mentor. And I wish that he were like around more. I wish he were around right now. I wish he had been around for Ace and that Ace got to meet him and have somebody better to model his behavior after. Um, so coming back to the area in the forest where Jinbei and Luffy are, 
Luffy is just beating his fist into the ground. And Jinbei is like, you've got to stop this dude. You can't keep injuring yourself. And Luffy says, it's my body. So it's none of your business. And Jinbei says, what about Ace, who sacrificed his body for your safety? What about that? And Luffy gets big mad over that. And is like, if you fucking say anything else, I'm going to crush you. And Jinbei's like, you're welcome to try, but in your current condition, that shit is not going to work. And Luffy decides to throw a punch and Jinbei grabs his arm and just flips him onto his back immediately. And you would think that it would be sort of Luffy going, all right, well, I guess that's not going to work. But it just is a moment the dust settles and Luffy is about to go for it again. He is so full of rage here. And this is when we get the flashback with Jinbei talking to Ace back in the cells. And Ace is saying, um, back on Alabasta, I saw my brother for the first time in three years. As soon as I saw his face, a weight lifted from my heart. And do you know why? And it sort of pauses here, but what he winds up saying is it wasn't seeing that he was safe. It was seeing that he had friends, you know, people who had his back. And I really, really liked that, you know, seeing it's one thing to trust the person, but you got to know, like, one person can only do so much and defend themselves against so much. Um, But Jinbei starts talking to Luffy in the moment. He's like... Because Luffy goes after him and he finally has to hold Luffy by the throat against a rock and be like, I get it. Everything seems bleak and dark right now. And you had confidence that came from your relationship and with him. And now it's nothing but doubt everywhere you look. I understand. And we see a sort of montage of some of Luffy's like worst losses which is really interesting. It's almost like he's having a bit of like a PTSD flashback, you know, and it's all done. Like there are bubbles that are sort of closing in on him. It's weird imagery. Um, but in very extreme, like color gradients that make everything look crazy. And, uh, he's, he comes back to himself and Jinbei says, as long as you are, consumed by regret and guilt you will never find your way forward your pain may be great but you mustn't let it devour you there is yet joy beyond your sorrows what's gone may be gone but you still have something left in this world to treasure don't you and there's a long pause and then all of a sudden Luffy opens his eyes and he realizes what Jinbei is saying. And he begins to think about his crewmates and his friends and counting them on each hand. And it's so sweet, you guys. He's like putting one finger down for each one that he thinks of. And the memory that he has of each of them. Uh, First, we have Zoro, who's doing weightlifting. Uh, hey, want to screw around? Go do it somewhere else. I'm trying to build some muscle here. Then we go to uh, Nami. Luffy, we've got a big storm on the horizon. Make preparations quick. And as he's counting down each of these, and he is thinking, remembering each of his friends, one of the huge bubbles that's sort of like inching closer and almost consuming him disappears in this weird sort of like other space of trauma that's going on in his head. It's, I really, really loved this, you guys. Like the, having it be his friends that he is able to sort of regroup for and remember and prioritize even if it's like his own life feels so bleak and empty right now there are people in it who matter still and 
even if just for their sakes, you know, I really, really loved this. It was so sweet. And you see like the cracks forming in the sort of shell that had developed around him and all this light pouring in and each of his friends saying his name and smiling at him. And it was just so sweet. It was just adorable. It's interesting though, because he's got 10 fingers. He's only got nine crewmates and he had said that he wanted 10 in the flashback. So there's still room for one more. And I really wonder who's going to be that last one. Um, but yeah, he starts sobbing, crying and saying all of their names. They're still out there waiting for me. And Jimbei says, now do you see? I, and Luffy says, I have to get back on the ship no matter how long it takes me. So I'm really excited. I'm wondering how this is going to work. Like, is he going to have to sail around and find them? Is there going to be a way that they just somehow like wind up at the same place that's going to be sort of kismet? Um, I don't know. Because he's saying he wants to go back to Sabaody because he thinks that they will be there. But they are so far from Sabaody, most of them. I don't know how that would even happen, you know? Um, yeah, I, I really don't know. Uh, so Jimmy says, I don't have to worry anymore. Like in the present, remembering what Ace had said about Luffy having a crew that he could depend on. And then Luffy just starts saying, I miss them. I miss my crew. And that is the end of the episode. So this was just a really good couple episodes, guys. I really liked these and I enjoyed Luffy having an arc that was like all him where we really didn't see everybody else. It was very focused in, in a way that the others haven't been, but I am really ready for everybody to start getting back together. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, I'm a little under time, but only a couple minutes and I feel like I've said everything I'm gonna. So I'm going to wrap this up. Um, thank you, Florian, again for commissioning this. Appreciate it. Thank you guys for joining me. And until next time, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.